All righty, folks. We are doing it. We're back. We're back in our, our daily videos here. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Thank you guys so much for uh, coming out and checking out this show on the internet. By, by coming out, I mean uh, being plugged into your computers nonstop uh, while we go through... <laughs> The, the continual transition. Welcome to week three of uh, me doing these videos every goddamn day. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, this is this is me being facetiously bitchy uh, <laughs> about this stuff. Uh, hey, I had a really great time um, doing the live uh, videos yesterday. Um, I uh, uh, am, am very much enjoying the, the live videos. Um, if you guys are not familiar with it... Um, Every Sunday, I'm going to go uh, live and chat with you guys. I've been thinking back and forth about maybe doing one or two more of these sort of live streams um, uh, throughout the week, maybe. Um, it kind of depends on how much energy I have and how many stories I can do enough research about to talk about. I'm... I, I'm, I'm very, it's very difficult for me to, like, not go, you know, deep into some of this shit and really talk about it. There's, there's a couple that, that are pretty, like, oh, we covered a shit ton of information in 10 minutes that I can pull from and, and really, like, talk interesting ideas about. So, um, that's part of the reason why I'm not doing as much. So, th what these, these videos that you see, uh, six days out of the week... And is they are pre-recorded and then I premiere them, which are a little bit different than going live. It means that it's it's like a it's like a premiere, right? It's like the first time that it's aired on the internet. It's the first time that it's aired on YouTube or Facebook, which is primarily where these videos go. Um, and one of the changes I'm going to have to make uh, on the audio end is. Um, I'm going to have to reduce how much content I put up audio, uh, primarily because it's a space issue and a financial issue. Um, Libsyn, the the plan that I have right now, um, I'm spending close to a hundred bucks on um, uploading content on Libsyn, and be, and this normally, you know, I think what I would do is um, push the the Patreon or the sustaining memberships, and on a regular basis, I think it would have um, it would have probably covered the costs of that. And it's looking like, you know, I'm I'm pretty close to be just being able to cover the cost of it, to, just in, in terms in, in terms of that. But considering that we are in financially troubled times. Um, it's becoming a little bit diff difficult to sustain those costs. So I'm going, and, and because I'm also going to be releasing um, newer full episodes of Forkful along with these daily videos that are going to be coming out, um, it is going to be a little bit more difficult to sustain the costs of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose um so as you know that b from between sunday and thursday i release these videos which are uh primarily like three news stories or ideas that i would like to discuss and go into detail about and you know add some comedic flair to it and stuff like that um and it, these are looser more ranty videos so what i might do is choose either one maybe two um, and release those uh, every day as part of the audio format. Now, if you want the full, like the full one, you're gonna have to. Um, you know, I'm 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 sorry that this is sort of the way that it has to be uh, until until this thing is sort of adjusted itself and people actually have enough funds and I have enough funds to get back out there and. Um, do do more you know live events and touring as 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 i as i do and uh part of it is um until we get to that point it, it, it's going to be difficult to sustain that financially um so i'm going to have to reduce my my financial obligation to the audio version of the podcast let's put it that way 
uh, which basically means um, until I get more funds, until I get a li like more um, solidified ways of making an income again um, through comedy, through touring, and all of that sort of stuff, um, the audio version of this is going to be limited, and uh, you, you really where you're going to get a lot, a uh, lot more content is via the YouTube or via um, the Facebook page with the premieres and the lives and all that sort of stuff. Um, with that being said, um, I am working on doing a show via Zoom um, because that is an option that I have. Um, I would have to test it. So one of the ways that I'm going to test it is through Patreon. What I might do is pick a day and write some shorter little material and maybe go into that um, like pick a day and time, maybe run a poll on my Patreon or something, um, and see when people are available and try to run a test and maybe do a couple of shorter little jokes that I can write and maybe, maybe go on there for, uh, 15 to 30 minutes and do a test and get some feedback, um, of the live event and uh and do a short live show uh at some point in april um you know and i might have to limit that to 15 to 20 people something along those lines at first just to see if this thing is going to work um and you know i i talked to my friend ron placone who some of you out there watching might know ron placone um and basically uh try to run the show is 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 how I think we might uh, have to do it is is some of the material is going to come from some of these stories that I've worked on. Um, and as you know, I have a bunch of these notes that I can kind of go back and I can kind of go back and listen to the video and write them out, write them out in some kind of a, some kind of format. And I will probably have to type it out uh, just so, because my handwriting sometimes is not particularly great. Um, and, and have the material and do like a 30 minute show, 40 minute show or something along between, I, I would probably say it'll end up being between 30 and 45 minutes. Um, and it would, it would run on zoom. I would sell tickets to the show, uh, buy brown paper tickets, kind of keep it cheap, um, and keep it limited. So if you are a sustaining member, you automatically get a free ticket to come see this. That's one thing I'm going to do is is if you become a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to come see come come see the show, this sh this semi live show and then sell tickets to to the rest of the people and advertise it like I normally would. Um, and, you know, that would very much help me kind of get through this thing and it would help you guys also see some newer stuff that I'm working on. So when you come see me live. Because the formatting is going to be different, right? Uh, the, the, the way that I'm going to have to do this is probably more um, shorter jokes. It'll be a different style of writing for me. It won't be as long for me and conversational and ranty as it normally is. I think there might be one or two pieces that'll get that way, but um, it's going to have to also be a little bit more topical, uh, which is why doing stuff like this is probably going to be the... Um, the best way of doing it. Uh, so um, that is in the works. That is something that I am uh, contemplating and thinking about. Um, and I will have the opportunity to toy around with a little bit more um, pending that I, uh, I don't get burned out, which I don't think I will because I do have a little bit better of a plan in, in terms of like how I'm going to operate my day. Um, so I think that's going to be sort of the course of action that I'm going to have to take. Um, and, and I'm excited about it. Sorry, kind of spaced out there for a minute. Uh, but, but I am, I am excited about it. I'm excited 
changing up the format a little bit. It's going to, it's going to alleviate some of the workload, um, for me, uh, in terms of uploading the audio and, uh, all of that jazz, um, it is going to uh, give me a reason to be a little bit more creative and have some sort of a creative outlet um, for that in that regard. Uh, so I'm excited about that, about sharing that with you guys. And it's going to it's going to help me come up with, you know, a couple of different um, different types of formats for the show. So I might be able to explore like doing some more of these late nighty topical kind of jokes into more idea driven jokes, uh, digging deeper into new story type of jokes, digging deeper into idea based type of jokes. So, yeah, I would I would I'm going to plan on I'm planning on doing that. So keep your eyes out. And if you want to be part of the patron test, if you want to be part of the Patreon test, you can obviously join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Krishmohan. Ha ha. Um, and, um, what I, what I might do to kind of ease that process too, is when I put out the ticketing, I might have a code, uh, applicable to the patrons or the sustaining members that would give them free access to the show. Um, so if you want to become a sustaining member, that will also allow you to get a free ticket to the show and go to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate, um, in order to do that. But the other portion of this check-in uh, two is that I think uh, what I have determined is that Sunday also needs to be a decompression day for me uh, because I'm, I'm doing these every day. I'm trying to write every day. I'm trying to keep up on my physical and mental health every day um, and it becomes demanding and I think I need a day where I can just kind of veg out and not do a goddamn thing. Um, and I think that's going to have to be my Sundays. So basically it's, it's go do the live stream. Um, concentrate on that for the front portion of the day and then by like 1 1 30 um, I can you know get all the videos uh, chopped up and up onto the uh, uh, onto the YouTubes and the Facebookery and then onto the audio version and uh, um, you know move into just kind of relaxing out for the day whether that is um, that is go back to my drawings uh, cause I haven't really drawn in, in several, several months. Um, I don't get the opportunity to do that. And I genuinely do miss, uh, just being creative on that front. Um, and that'll be an opportunity too, is, is, um, for you guys to check out some interesting, fun, cool things that I'm doing. Um, I miss that. Um, and, uh, or reading, I miss reading. Um, I'm still trying to get through my books. Uh, I'm so in, and just kind of watching some show and turning the brain off for a little while and letting it recuperate. I think I, I very much need something like that. Um, so, uh, with that being said, uh, we are pushing forward through the week. Um, you know, I had a little bit of a slow start to today. Uh, but I am hoping that the rest of the week will be um, at an optimal level of productivity. That is my goal. That is what I'm looking for. Uh, and some people already complained about me possibly losing the the um, the uh, the the um, uh, robe that I have on. I, mean, I lost that word for a minute. Holy shit, you guys, that was weird. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, been talking about, Hey, maybe I'll lose the robe. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's starting, it's going to start getting warm and some people have already, uh, complained about it. And, uh, it's lucky you, uh, it is, it is back to being weirdly chilly outside. We had like two days where the weather was beautiful and now we're back to being, uh, weirdly chilly outside. Um, so, you know, um, the robe is sticking around for a little bit longer, I guess. And I'm going to have to figure out what to do about a summer robe situation, something a little bit lighter, something a little bit thinner. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I guess I'm, I'm going to try to look for that at some point. Uh, that is going to be the, that's going to be the goal. Um, but let's get into some of our stories for today. I am excited because I made graphics that I think I'm going to try to use on a consistent basis um, and, and kind of make this a little bit more interesting and dynamic of a show so you guys aren't just staring directly at my face constantly all the time. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, it, it just adding a little bit of a uh, little bit of dynamism to the show. I, as you can see uh, here, bam, there it is. That's where the finger points to. You have a little bit of little the little name tag there for me. Um, so if you are a new viewer that ends up catching uh, this show on the on the YouTubes or the Facebookeries or whatever, uh, there you go. That's my name, uh, Chris Mohan. That's where you can follow me on all the social medias, Chris Mohan, haha. Um, and it's a nice little branded graphic that I'm that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, so, without any further ado, I know we've kind of rambled on. Uh, I had a, I had several realizations yesterday while I was vegging out um, that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, that I'm excited that I shared with you guys. So let's let's get into our very first story um, of uh, of the hour. So our first story has to do with Comcast versus Byron Allen. Um, I think this story kind of disappeared in the news a little bit um, because I had, there was vague notions of it a little while back, and then it just kind of disappeared. Right. But but it reappeared last week because the Supreme Court did make a decision um, that uh, Comcast won against this uh, lawsuit that Byron Allen had put out against him over racial discrimination. Um, now, in the lower courts, uh, they did win. He 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 won. Um, uh, well, he won against Charter, I believe, because Charter Charter also had the same problem as Comcast did and he won in the lower courts, courts against Charter uh, but he did not win against uh, Comcast and the Charter decided to take it up to the to the higher courts um, and uh, I think they lost that again but then same thing happened here is Byron Allen decided that well if Charter is going to do this against me in the higher courts I might as well do the same thing um, against Comcast, uh, and that's what he did. And the, what he based it off of was um, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866. And, uh, and he said that uh, that's, you know, th there were contractual problems with, with how Comcast was um, kind of implementing their standards for his channels to be included on their network. Um, and he has like comedy.tv, justice.tv, um, and it's a black owned business. So, you know, that's the, the programming has that urban element to it or, or uh, some urban element to it. Um, so uh, the civil, so he, he put, he pushed the discrimination lawsuit um, under the Civil Rights Act of 1866 uh, with the but for standard. So let's start with the Civil Rights Act of 1866. What, what does that say, right? So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 says, I hope you guys can see this, um, is all persons with the jurisdiction of the United States shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts to sue, be parties, give evidence, and to the full and equal benefit of law and proceeding for the security of persons and properties as is enjoyed by white citizens and shall be subject to like punishments, pains, penalties, taxes, licenses, and exactions of every kind and to no other. Um, interesting that it, they, they have to qualify that um, the, the white citizens part uh, of, of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866 there. And this is what, this is what uh, Byron Allen is, is, is saying in that uh, Comcast violated, right, um, by, by uh, evoking this but-for standard, implying that the deal would have gone through had it not been a black-owned business. Um, you know, the deal would have gone through if not for the reasons of race or skin color, and that's why it didn't go through that they are discriminating against Byron Allen because he uh, is, is a black man. And um, Gorsuch uh, was the final ruling and basically said that, uh, no, Comcast did not racially discriminate against you guys, um, you know, because, because, of, uh, because they didn't. <laughs> and this is, this is very interesting to me because this is once again an example where Comcast, as a corporation, is deemed innocent and we have to prove that they are guilty, right? When it comes to these sort of accusations um, that a corporation is racist or sexist or something like that, 
they are innocent until proven guilty. So when these accusations are levied towards them, um, it is up to the uh, plaintiff to prove that the defendant um, is guilty of said claims. Uh, so innocent until proven guilty. So we're trying to prove guilt. And corporations always have, always get the innocent before proven guilty, whereas we, the people, do not get that. A a average citizens have to prove their innocence rather than the guilt. Right? We 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 are, you know, like think about it. Is when you go to a traffic court over a parking ticket or. Um, a speeding ticket or whatever the violation is, and you go to this traffic court, the average citizen has to prove that they're innocent rather than the courts have to prove their guilt. We are not innocent before proving it. We are already deemed guilty, and now we have to levy against that. But it's the flip side for corporations. The corporations are proven innocent, or, or rather they, they, are, they are claimed to be innocent and have to be proven that they're guilty. It's a backward system. And I think I do think that uh, you know we've normalized this shit through courtroom dramas because courtroom dramas are always built like this. Courtroom dramas are always just an average person that is accused of a crime and uh, they, are, they are guilty and now they have to prove their innocence, right? That's always how it is. Rather than saying, um, okay, you are innocent and um, you know, like we, you know, they're always like in jail, <laughs> you know, like how, how do you prove the, how is it the, if, if, if the system is that you're innocent until proven guilty, how is it that the innocent person is always in jail or always, you know, kept in some sort of temporary confinement or something like that, right? Like that's not proving, that's not claiming that you're innocent. That is 100% claiming that you're guilty and now you have to prove that you're innocent so you can get out of jail. Uh, and we see so many cases of that, right? Like especially like racial cases that, that revolve around, um, that revolve around this notion that you have to prove you're innocent, but for corporations, it's the, the other side has to prove guilt. Like this, it's, it's a very, it's, it's that skewed system. Like we're skewed. That's what it is. That's, that's what this is showing. And, you know, there is proof of um, Comcast being racist because they have a pattern of it. They have a pattern of racial discrimination. And uh, oddly enough, it deals with 50 Cent. 50 Cent show power was removed um, from the start, or, or rather, I think Stars was removed from Comcast, which carried power. And, <coughs> excuse me, 50 Cent called out Comcast and the CEO, Brian Roberts. Um, and he basically said, uh, when this happened in 2018, he said, this guy's fucking up power over at Comcast for no reason, Brian Roberts, motherfucker, looks like he's been pushing, push, pushed around his whole life. He needs to chill out, go to a golf course, and sit his ass down somewhere. Right, so they basically claim that uh, Stars is a network that um, helps out urban, uh, urban shows. They put more urban content on there, and uh, Comcast is removing it uh, because they don't like urban content. And... Uh, Comcast's argument is, oh, well, we have standards. We have specific standards that, you know, the, the network didn't meet. We didn't, we didn't want to carry it because of our standards and our rules and so, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that's what their claim has always been. Even to Byron Allen, that's what their claim has always been, that there's a particular standard that Byron Allen show did not, did not meet, that his network did not meet it or, or what have you. What that, and that was the claim is, but they didn't have to prove like how it didn't meet those standards. That, that's what I never saw any of these stories talking about is, um, is, is all that, right? So, but Comcast was very pleased. They were very pleased at the court's uh, decision at this, right? Uh, they start by saying, we are pleased the Supreme Court unanimously restored certainty on the standard to bring and prove civil rights claim. The well-established framework that has protected civil rights for decades continues. The nation's civil rights laws have not changed with this ruling, and they remain the same as before the case was filed. Now, Byron, Byron Allen 
uh, in a statement said that this is harmful to civil rights of millions of Americans, right? Um, they didn't restore standards to civil rights because this is not the way that the law works. <laughs> I mean, if they were restored... If, if 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 civil rights was really restored, then we would be opening up a bunch of other cases where um, people in the minority community, black, brown, women, LGBTQ, all of these minority identities, all these cases would be coming into question where they had to prove their innocence and not the fact that they were guilty, right? The... They were being accused of something, and the law state, the way that it works is that you're innocent until proven guilty. That's not what happened. All Neil Gorsuch did was say, uh, no, we're not going to look at racial discrimination under the but for standard. We're, we're just not. That's not how this, that's not how this works. Um, and look, at this point, a lot of people have uh, criticized Comcast and the Supreme Court for this decision, and rightfully so, and they should, because if if the claim is that but for standard, where was Comcast proof? Why is there no Why is there no story out there um, that is showing the defense that Comcast brought out, uh, saying that that we we have these you know, pristine standards that we are trying to meet. And here's what they are. And here's how uh, Byron Allen's network does not meet each of these standards. That is not, <laughs> I mean, I, I looked at a bunch of different sources, and but, but that argument is never shown in any of these media things, which leads me to believe that there wasn't one. That Comcast didn't really have a way to prove that Byron Allen's uh, network does not meet these pristine Comcast standards. Which, by the way, their 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 standards, if you you know, kind of look at the way that they run their customer support, is probably pretty fucking low. And raises a factor for contract negotiations, right? Um, right now, the way that they they say it is. Uh, Look, everything up till that final signing is totally fine and totally legal and within the rights of the company to do in terms of racial discrimination. Like, they don't consider it racial discrimination. Um, if, if you are racist and you practice things that would be considered racist up till that final point of signing, right? And uh, our, our RGB, Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, was the only person that uh, said anything in a rebuttal uh, against this ruling, she she penned a rebuttal, right? Why why she was against it, and and one of the statements that she made in there was, "Thus, a lender would not violate the law by requiring prospective borrowers to provide one reference letter if they are white and five if they are black. Nor would an employer violate the law by reimbursing expenses for white interviewees, but requiring black applicants to pay their own way." So, um, what, what does that mean? That means that whatever barriers corporations and companies and businesses and institutions want to put up up till that final point of agreement, they can do that, um, right? And, and we, I, mean, I mean, we see this shit everywhere. This is an argument that I've had with a bunch of people about, like, oh, is Trump racist? Is he really racist or does he just kind of care about money and he sees that... Um, you know, supporting black institutions and blah, 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 blah. And black people is not particularly profitable for him. Um, and he doesn't, so he doesn't do or say anything. But there are practices where, you know, he, his, his apartment complexes and his condos and stuff, like black people would come in and they would look around and they wouldn't turn them away at the door, but they would make a little mark to say that, well, we're not going to consider these people's applications. And then they just never would. They would never consider their applications, right? So... Up till that point of signing a contract, you can't claim that there is any sort of racial discrimination or racial bias based on what they do. Like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out, 
if if uh, an interviewee says, well, you're white and you probably had to take a bus to get down here. This is how you subvert class problems, by the way. Right. Like most of this is m most arguments really boil down to 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 class and how how class is affected by all of this. Um, and you can twist it, you can add a little, el an extra element to make it racist like this, right? So like the, the second point of this, where she says that um, interviewees could be uh, reimbursed, but, but black applicants would have to pay their own way. So let's say that you are a poor white person that lives further outside of town and you get an interview and you take a bus. Well, they'll go, how much did you, how much was it for the, for the bus? And they go, oh, well, it was, you know, 275 round trip. Well, they'll go, here's a five. Be on your way. Did you have lunch today? You know, did you have to buy lunch outside? Blah, 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 blah. And they go, well, here's $20 reimbursed. Be on your way. We'll see if we hire you or not. But a black applicant, does, they don't have to do that. And now we've added a racial element to the class struggle, uh, which is part of the way that they keep the classes divided, right? Like poor white people and poor black people essentially struggle through the same sort of financial burdens where they might not be able to afford rent. And now you've added an extra element to it where you've alleviated the white person's, the poor white person's problems, but not the poor, the white, poor black person's problems. And then now you can use that same thing to say, well, the poor white person wouldn't really have a problem to begin with if it wasn't for these poor black people. And now you're creating a uh, a, a class warfare using race as a, a igniting force behind it, right? So all of that is fine, according to this, right? Which is bullshit, which is crazy. Uh, all of that is fine. Um, I, I, where the problem would have come in is when the, when the contract was going to be signed, when everything is good to go, you know, the, let's say, uh, even though the black applicant and the and the the lender is whatever the they, the black person gets all five reference letters and they get everything stamped and they're good to go and it's like cool you completed the test good for you you completed this Indiana Jones level test that we put out there for you to get just a small business loan good for you nailed it good job you know you went through the maze um, when they're signing the contact contract. If that lender says the N word, that's when it becomes racial. That's when it's all, that's when it's the problem. And uh, that's bullshit. And I can tell you exactly why. Because most racism is subtle. It's not in your face. It's not just N word, you know, that's not what it is. That does exist for sure. Uh, but it's not the the primary way that racism is put forward into our society at this point, right? And and a very easy example for me to use for my personal life in this situation, um, instead of a hypothetical example, is like is when I was coming up. <laughs> And going through trying to get into clubs and, you know, with with particular bookers that would run shows at bars across the country and so on and so forth. Um, and I had the, I had people say this to me a bunch, you know, people like that that used to book for a bunch of clubs uh, that that, you, you know, were were like a decently sized booking agency. And I would come in and I would do these guest spots for them and I would do particularly well. Um, and they would tell me that I did particularly well, but then they would be, then these clubs and bookers would say, well, well, they can't book me because, you know, their, their audiences aren't particularly accustomed to someone like me or, or, or they wouldn't really understand, um, someone like me, right? Which is a very, very subtle way of, 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 of going around uh, saying something really racist, which is, uh, hey, a lot of people are going to blame you for, uh, uh, for 9-11 and, uh, and use a racial slur against you. And uh, that's why we're not going to book you, because 9-11 because and racial slurs. You know, like that, that level of racism is very, very subtle. It's not something that is going to be seen um, every day. The way they do it is a little different, you know. 
so because that racism is subtle, you have to look at every step. If a white person only has to f come up with one letter of recommendation, um, but a black person has to come up with five, that's racist. It's not calling them a slur. It's these subtle ways that these things are done that really need to be paid attention to, and that's what that's what the courts are not doing. That's that's what Neil Gorsuch is against, and it really that should be the reformation that we should be looking for in terms of this. Um, now there was also the DOJ, uh, Trump's Department of Justice, uh, that was looking for a motivation factor. That's what they were looking for, right? They're looking for a motivation factor, and and if we remember from last week, we did cover how. The Department of Justice is pretty much putting a moratorium on habeas corpus. So if this case would not have been determined and pushed through and, and you know, been a victory for Comcast or anything, I think we would have probably seen this thing uh, be put into put into limbo, right? But, but And it would have left Comcast to be in limbo, and that's a gray area. And for an all-white company, you know, with that pristine rule of standard, oof, that's a tough spot to be in. It's a little speck of dirt on that pristine, isn't it? So what was what was Comcast's real reason for not letting Byron Allen's channels on their platform? We don't know. I mean part of it was also probably the price tag. The 20 billion is a big big amount to be suing for. Um uh, but but you know his television network is available on Verizon, DirecTV, RCN, sudden link all of these channels carry them but comcast doesn't so what is what is different about their standards and we're not talking about that and until i mean that i mean that's the way that the law works is they don't have to prove that they just didn't have to prove that they didn't have to prove their level of standards but byron allen had to prove what they did was racist and they said no it's not because they didn't say the n-word during the during the proceedings, so it's not, you know, but they did, but they did deny black owned businesses. They do take off urban channels off their network, but that's fine. This is a huge, huge mistake, I think. Um, and this is, I mean, here, here's the other thing that kind of leads it down to, to a class struggle too, is Byron Allen, Byron Allen is a rich person, but he's a black rich person. So, uh, when he goes up against other members of the elites, let's add the racial component to it, and that way we'll we'll once again ignite the class war through the through the through the racial element. None of it's right. None of it's the none of it's morally the uh, the correct thing to do. Uh, but this this ruling is is total bullshit. It's total bullshit. So, all right. So let's move to story number two here um, in, in, our, in our Monday morning video. Our second story has to do with uh, our good friend uh, Julian Assange. Julian Assange was denied bail to get out of prison last week uh, amidst the COVID-19 situation that we are in. Um, Here's what the U.S. government said when he was denied bail by the Ministry of Justice and the judge that is proceeding over Julian Assange's trial. And by the way, before we get into that, I did do a pretty large piece, uh, for like a like a, a deep dive into um, Julian Assange's trial and why it's so important. Um, so there were several things that I covered in that. One of them being that this is being that the extradition is not fair. He was being spied on. He didn't have any privacy. He did so there was no client uh, client lawyer confidentiality situation because he was being spied on. So the 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 case should be thrown out. They're trying to say that it's not a political cr a crime. 
uh, or a political, he's not a political prisoner. This is not a political prosecution, even though it is. And they and they keep making hypocritical statements about how this damaged the political landscape because of what he did and what he's what um, what he's being extradited for and would be called into trial in America would be over political crimes, um, crimes of treason, which is a which is a political um, political criminal offense. Um, so there's a lot of contradictions to to what is happening with Assange in this context, um, but but they denied him bail, so he's still stuck in prison and his life is in danger. So check this out: uh, the United States government said that it's not up to any court or government to tell the Ministry of Justice what they've decided. The Ministry of Justice has decided that they're not going to grant him bail for various different reasons. Um, you know, so the United States has determined that the Ministry of Justice, in this regard, can't be uh you we can't tell them what to do but you can tell foreign governments that you want somebody extradited to their country and and how you should make the case uh to extradite them over into their country and how you should allow the united states to spy on said persons yeah you can do that right you can you can definitely tell them how to operate their their legal system and what loopholes and hypocrisies and bullshit that you can that they should spin around in their head um but you can't tell them that hey something that's morally right to do something that that is for the benefit of somebody's health during a global pandemic ah, we can't we can't tell other people how to run their business unless it benefits the united states Unless it benefits, unless it makes us look great, get this guy. Eh. We don't want to. We don't want to get involved with this guy unless it's putting him in prison. We don't want to get involved. So the Ministry of Justice did say that they might reevaluate. They might. They'll think about it. Oh, we don't know. Work. I mean, this is crazy. There's so many things that he's. Uh, but, you know, it's difficult. We got. We're so tired. Are you guys tired? I think we might. We got to go get tested. We got to go. We're, we're going to go get tested. And then we'll think uh, once the test, maybe the, you know, the situation, it, I don't know. It, it's just we got the British Bake Off. That's a thing. I don't know how Netflix is, how long it's going to be on on Netflix. It might be gone. It might be gone. You know, so we got to really we got to support. We got to support the British and the and, and, and the baked goods. Because, uh, because you know, the, the Brits are not known for food. And, and you know, if we're going to, uh, it's really a matter of national pride to support the British Bake Off. So we'll come, I mean, and Julian is not really British. He's Australian, which is different. And, you know, you know, the thing that they say about Australians is that uh, they're British criminals. So it's just like, that's, we just got to assume that he's already a criminal. And he's, and if we let him, he's going to commit all these crimes and, Real, did we mention the Bake Off? Did we mention, have you seen it? Have you seen the British Bake Because it's delightful. It's great. We got these cakes. I'll send, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll say, we'll think about it. So here's the other thing that the Ministry of uh, Justice has also said, right? The health of an individual won't be relevant uh, for the risk of an individual absconding on bail so they're basically saying that he'll run away on bail that's what he'll do because he's done that before he's absconded from bail before oh when sweden said that he was uh in charge of this crime and even though he went in and gave all these statements repeatedly and they couldn't find any evidence to to claim that uh, that, that, that 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 uh, uh, what he was being charged for was was actually real, uh, you know. E even though all of that happened, there was no evidence to to say that what he did was 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 uh, uh, was what he was being accused of was actually true. They proved his innocence through the law system um, in Sweden, and uh, and they were still calling him. Uh, and you know, they, and Sweden has this track record of extraditing people to the United States without any uh, w trials, or uh, they just kind of do it because you know Sweden. They're so nice. They're they're nice people. And you know, he so so he went and he he seeked asylum, and Ecuador granted it. Uh, uh, you know, and he was seeking asylum uh, against the country's uh, the horrific crimes of of war and corporatism and. Uh, you know, if he got extradited to the United States, they would treat him really badly and probably treat him uh, ki kind of like 
a, a terrorist, um, that, that is uh, absconding. Look, seeking asylum is not absconding, you idiots. Seeking asylum against a country that is committing international crimes against whistleblowers and doing unjust things, doing unconstitutional things, that is illegal. <laughs> so this guy was just protecting himself from a corrupt legal system. And when you have a corrupted legal system, you have to be creative in the way that you protect yourself from it. Because that legal system is sure as shit going to be creative on the way that it's going to fuck you over, as we constantly see over and over again. Right? They look for these little language loopholes. They make the law a little bit more complicated. They use you know, language from ye old times, from 14.9-3. This is how they talk to 14. So we're going to adhere to these laws from 14.9-3 and apply them to, to regular context, to, to the new agey world context, but still use the laws from the time where the, none of these new agey world things were happening. So they also claim that he might go out and commit other crimes. What the fuck? Where? What? How? Like, what crimes is he going to commit? Is he going to go fucking rob a bank? Too bad the banks are robbing themselves <laughs> by killing the economy with this, with, with the way that, you know, the, the, the bailout systems are going. Like, he's, he, what is there to rob? Fake money? <laughs> where is the proof of this? Seeking asylum is not absconding from bail. It's not running away from something. That's seeking asylum against an unjust system. And he needs to be protected. So and that, one of the other things it says, we have seen that he, 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 he's willing to go to any lengths to obstruct justice from extradition. By seeking trial? Because he thinks that being extradited to the United States is the wrong thing? Like it's an illegal thing? which it is because he would be a political prisoner in America because he is being extradited over a 108-year-old law that has no application but is a political crime law. Like, that's what... What, what are you talking about? Ex the Espionage Act is, is about a political crime, so he would be a political criminal, and he seeked asylum in the, in the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK, so that means the UK is fucking going to make him a political prisoner and extradite him to a country which according to the US UK treaty you can't fucking do they claim that the risk of flight is insurmountable w once again fucking how the dude is like he hasn't tried to escape from prison has he does he have a fucking photo of a a, a, a saucy pinup lady and behind there, you guys discovered a, a very deep, deep tunnel that he is, he is digging out of to, to Andy Dufresne himself to escape extradition illegally. Like, what the fuck? Where is the goddamn proof of this? What we have seen proof of is undeniable cruelty from the Ministry of Justice and the judge in the, in the UK against a publisher, against someone that did their fucking job. They're also claiming that Assange doesn't fall into the category of uh, a vulnerable person during this crisis, right? That's what they're saying. So, uh, which is also bullshit. That's also false because he has four respiratory in infections. He's had four respiratory in infections in the, in the seven years that he was in the embassy. He's had tooth decay problems and major mental health concerns, including cardiac concerns because of that, right? When you're depressed, when you're anxious, when you're stressed out and your cortisol levels go up, you become immunocompromised. You're, you're much more likely to be sick in those stages because your body is not building up enough antibodies. There's, hormonally speaking, you're, you're just not developing enough to, to fight back any sort of illness that your body might uh, encounter. So, you know, and all of these things are compounding effects, right? The respiratory illness, like COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So anybody that's had like major respiratory illness in the last year is immunocompromised, is part of that vulnerable, uh, 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 vulnerable class of people, right? So he's immunocompromised. They're basically like, well, he's not in the age group that's... Uh, that's that that this is dangerous for and sure yes sure he's 40 he's in his 40s he's 48 right but this situation 
uh, has aged him like an extra 40 years. And that's, and that's what illegal detentions and, uh, and, and, and tortures do, is that they, they age you rapidly. It's like the worst form of time travel ever, right? Like when somebody's just like, you want to travel forward in time? Oh, wow, that sounds really cool. Great, get into this isolation chamber. And you'll travel into the future. And it's like, yeah, it's because you age them 40 years by, by torturing them. Just like seeking asylum isn't absconding, torture is not time travel. Here's one thing you could do um, is you could, uh, you could return Julian Assange um, to the Ecuadorian embassy during this time, right? Um, you, could, you could provide him a safe house from, you could, you know, you could sanitize the asylum down and you could, uh, you know, you could, you could get him back into the asylum. And look, you know, he can be monitored. He's not going to go anywhere. Uh, I mean, Undercover Global was already spying on him on the behalf of the CIA. Boom. There you go. Dunzo. You already got the cameras and all the equipments all set up. Even in the ladies' room, you, you got that camera set up, which is creepy as shit. And somehow or another, Undercover Global, you guys managed to be creepier than Jeff Bezos. So congratulations. Great job. Now, prisons where he is, he's in Belmarsh Prison right now, uh, are incubators for infections and uh, infectious diseases, right? Iran, because they knew that, uh, this country that's supposed to be this evil dictatorship, they're fucking ass-backwards people living in the caves and giant... I mean, it looks, it looks like a skyscraper, but it's just like a big... It's like a rectangle cave is what that is, okay? Like, that's how they're this authoritarian, backwards, religious leadership. Like, they're seen as these evil people. Released 85,000 prisoners because prisons are incubators for infections. Meanwhile, the Western world is torturing a, a publisher under false charges in an 108-year-old law that doesn't apply in modern times. Yeah, Iran's the backward one. <laughs> Here's something that Assange just said, that he would rather commit suicide than be extradited to the United States. And that's how fucking terrible the United States justice system is to whistleblowers. That somebody would rather take their own life than go through our legal system. That says a lot about the legal system. How come the United States justice system doesn't have to prove that? That they, that they are somebody that doesn't want somebody to commit suicide, that they are, they are actually about equality and actually about upholding the law instead of making up laws to like help corporate criminals and war criminals around the world? How come they don't have to prove that? How come that hasn't come into questions? How come they don't have to prove that this is this awful pit of despair, xenophobia, and hate driven out by authoritarian manifest destiny? How come they don't have to prove that? Now, what they do claim is that he is, you know, oh, by doing, revealing all, these, all this classified information, you know, all these, all these behind closed doors, secret meeting information, that he has put so many lives at risk. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The lives. The lives that are at risk. Oh, dear. Oh, mercy, mercy. The lives that are at risk. Well, there's been no proof that he has endangered um, even one life. Um, uh, but the United States is endangering they endangering his life uh, with this extradition by not saying something to the Ministry of Justice to get him out of prison, despite the fact that he is a vulnerable individual that has been tortured psychologically and physically at this point. And the U.S. has also endangered the lives of countless other people with its militarism, its corporatism, and its authoritarian manifest destiny principles of, uh, of, of operating as a government. But we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. You know, we kind of just ignore that sort of stuff. That is not what, uh, what, what, what we want to bring up in this situation. Just all the lies, all the propaganda, and all the twisted little things that we have to say to continue the torture of a publisher 
that revealed the war crimes and the corporate crimes of the elite, not just in America, but also globally. And now they have to make up lies and hypocrisies to justify to continue torturing him so that when his trial does show up, um, when his trial does show up in May, if it shows, if, if they get to the trial in May, he is not going to be mentally fit to, 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 to make a solid case for defense. And, you know, the, the justice, his, his legal defenses are going to be scrambling to keep his health up to date. And, and a court case. Whew. Got a little heated on that one. All right, let's move to our final story. Uh, this final story uh, uh, comes from um, Sagar and Jetty at Crystal Ball. Uh, on Hill.tv, they have a show called Rising. Uh, very good show. I'm, I'm a fan of it. Uh, but one, So a couple days ago, I think dur the day after everything with the stimulus checks and all that shit was uh, determined, um, we were at 3.2 million people claiming unemployment, and Wall Street had its best day since 1933, which is great. Oh, my God. <sighs> Are you guys relieved that Wall Street had its best day since 1933? Holy shit, you guys, I am. Because finally, the rich are catching a break. Because if we all know anything about the rich, uh, boy, it's been, it's been tough times for them. You know, they weren't able to afford a new jet the last couple of weeks. Uh, they, were, they were like running out of ways to fuck over the poor. And they were like, how are we going to do it? You know, which is really stressful uh, when you're trying to exploit the labor of the working class. And they weren't. You know, how are they going to exploit labor when there isn't anybody laboring right now? I mean, that is whew, stressful times. It was real stressful. So, you know, this is great. Um, they can finally get back to their golf courses again. Oh, aren't you guys relieved? What Sagar points out is that we're heading to another uh, housing crisis because uh, there's no guarantee on rent and mortgage moratoriums. So some of these landlords and banks might say, well, okay, we're gonna forego the payments uh, for the next one or two months or something along those lines, but you're still gonna have to make these payments. Um, and, you know, it's like, well, but why would you have a total moratorium and forgiveness and all this stuff when, uh, you know, we're gonna get that 1200 bucks in four months, that should take care of it. Oh my gosh, in four months, you're going to have enough money to pay rent for maybe a, maybe a month? Oh, you're going to be great. It's going to be fine. Look, here's the thing. America is not good at math. We all know this. America is like 48th at math. And, and part of the reason um, America has trouble with math is because we forgot to carry the greed. You know, we forgot that if you just carried the greed, all of this would make sense. So even if delayed payment um, occurred, right, if they even if they deferred these rent payments, if they deferred these mortgages during a time when uh, a lot of Americans are out of work, they're looking for unemployment, they're 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 trying to, you know, a lot of the a lot of poor people make their money off cash and that's not part of the unemployment system. Um that's money is still due. These companies aren't forgoing the money and extending the loans or anything like that in terms of rent. Um, they're just kind of delaying it and saying, well, if you can't pay April, you can pay it in May, but you're still going to have to pay April and May in May. That's not forgiveness or a moratorium. So we're not going to be able to make these payments either. And right now, chain restaurants like Cheesecake Factory aren't able to make their rents. Uh, and corporate commercial rent, um, we're, we're at uh, $3, three trillion in debt, which has surpassed 08, right? But here's the thing. These chain restaurants, I bet they'll be fine. Oh, they're going to be fine, you guys. They're not, they, they don't got shit to worry about. They'll get bailed out. We've already seen evidence of that. That's been the that's been the prevailing pattern forever. Is they're one hundred percent going to get bailed out? 
people aren't. They're not giving us any forgiveness on it. But I bet the landlords will be like, oh, Cheesecake Factory? Yeah, don't worry about it. You pay your rent when you feel like you need to pay your rent. Don't worry about it. You just throw in a free cheesecake for your old pal landlord and you'll be fine. Okay, I will take a red velvet. I will take a red velvet. And this is this is part of the problem of the way things run is because when when there's not, you know, any money going into rents or mortgages or bank payments or debt payments or anything, that means there are no returns to Wall Street because it's not a I mean this this economy is all about how much we trust Wall Street, how much faith we have in in the market system and the stock markets and all this instead of how much how much faith do we really have in ourselves, right? Like like we're how much faith do we how much do we want to invest in each other instead of these invisible f made up figures and that's how the that's how everything is run that's how everything is run market value is investment mortgage bonds these are all complex unnecessary financial institutions and loopholes that are put in place to make rich people even richer that's how it is but right now the problem in our system is that everything has a fucking price tag everything has a price tag that's the problem with the system and Really, at this point, the question should be, based on everything that's happened in the last two weeks just alone, just in the last two weeks alone, I think the question should be asked is what deserves to have a price tag on it and what doesn't? Healthcare, should that have a price tag on it? How much is a human life worth? How much is your health worth? Should education, should knowledge have a price tag on it? I mean, we made up these industries. The banking industry is a completely made up industry. That's why all these rules get made up. And none of these rules seem to make sense. But again, eh, we forgot to carry that greed, didn't we? They're just new ways to exploit each other. That's all this is. And if, if something doesn't change, then I think we are going to see some kind of a populist political revolution. Um, soon sooner rather than later and i mean a lot of people have been talking about it and there's a there's a lot of dread right now in our society and if you look at the way that these sort of financial institutions run and look at the way that that they are they are handed gifts um they have a gift economy because the government just hands money to them all the time uh we have a oligarchical plutocracy a kleptocracy They are just giving this money. And that means that uh, we're gonna have to make some pretty major changes by not buying into their system. So, you know, I had a, a friend of mine that was trying to explain to me stocks and bonds and well, you know, oh, these, these corporate, corporate CEOs only make X amount of, they only make millions of dollars instead of billions of dollars. The rest is in equity and stocks and bonds and market shares and this, that, and the other thing. And it's just like, all of this stuff is hyper complicated so that they don't have to pay their fair share back to the taxation system to help keep the infrastructure of the system alive, to help pay for social programs, to help their workers um, and, and just regular average middle class people. These are all loopholes to keep the rich richer. And that system we no longer have to buy into, right? Like 401ks are pretty much a huge scam that's connected, tied back into the market so that poor people saving up for their retirement have to invest and buy into all of these other made up systems that, that create Wall Street. For what though? But for what? Like what do we get at the end of the day? We don't get shit. We just look at the system that we have right now. It collapsed in a matter of a, a day. Like everybody freaked out. And we're not back up on our feet. And it's been, it's, this is the third week that we're not back up on our feet. And I mean, if, if you pump $1.5 trillion and trickle down was supposed to work, we would all be back to how things are supposed to run. But that's not how it works. And this is proof of that. This is glaring proof of that. So we might be headed for it. And it's up to us, right? We are, we are, there is a lot more of us than there are of them. Um, so we have to make a change and how we handle this populist political revolution is either going to come from uh, community organization, mutual aids, uh, depending on each other um, and not investing in this made up bullshit 
that bails them out all the time, but investing in each other, right? Investing in uh, small businesses, small to medium level businesses. I would I would go so far as to say even medium level businesses or, or, or you know, um, large corporations, huge big businesses, all of the ones that trade within the stock market of like, oh, we're just going to move money around. We're going to acquire this over here and somehow somebody's going to make some kind of money and you're just like, but okay, I guess, I guess you're the expert. And it's just like, no, they're not the expert. They made up some rules. Fuck all that. Stay in what's real. How are we going to help each other on the ground floor? How are we going to create a community system that when Wall Street fails and they keep bailing them out, how are we going to sustain ourselves? And that's going to come from us investing in us, not us investing in a power structure that has no consideration for us. All right. I think I think that's the end of it. I riled myself up. <laughs> Fired up. I'm fired up and ready to go, you guys. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please, please, please share it out. Um, hit that share button. Share it with friends. Share it with enemies. Share it into groups. Uh, share it with whoever you feel is is uh, is someone that would enjoy content like this, someone that would um, get something out of content like this. Um, I'm going to be, like I said, I'm going to be doing these every single day. Make sure that you're subscribed. Make sure you're getting notifications. These will probably go up towards the end of the day, between 5 and 6. That's sort of the time frame that I'm looking at to put these videos up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, um, so, you know, if you're still kind of in working in that 9 to 5 mode, which, you know, I'm, I'm very much also trying to be in that regular workday mode as well. So I get it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be putting them up a, around that time. And uh, also, um, I'll, be, I'll be in the chats. Like I said, this is a premiere. It's not live. So I won't be reacting within the video because the video is pre-recorded. Um, but I will be able to comment back because I will be in the chats. I will be, in, I will be monitoring the chats. Um, so leave a comment in the chat, leave a comment for later. Um, I will respond to them as well. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, like I mentioned, the audio version is going to be curtailed a little bit and that's primarily because of financial reasons. So, but if you do have the financial means, we're all kind of in this together. We're all kind of struggling through this together, but if you do have the financial means, um, to become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation, uh, go to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Um, keep your eyes peeled for um, me to try to run that test if you are a sustaining member because um, I will be running, I will probably put something up about it in the next couple days in regards to um, what I want to do about running a quick test. It'll probably be like 15 to 30 minutes of uh, playing around and figuring out some logistics. And then at the end of it, maybe having a conversation with, with this, with you guys during that test to be like, what did you like? What did, what didn't you like? Where did you feel like this was a problem or that was a problem or did this come off smoothly? What, what are your recommendations? Um, and then doing maybe one or two of these at some point, um, you know, to, uh, to help with all of this, this craziness that we are in, um, because, because we're all in it together. So, uh, and I, and I still want to like run material by you guys and do, do like a live show, especially to places that I know, um, you know, I haven't been to that. I had to cancel shows like, uh, Baltimore Williams, like all these places. I, I want to be able to like, be able to connect with you guys in some form or fashion. Um, yeah, so that is the plan for now. Uh, but thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting this. Uh, I know this was a little bit of a longer one uh, to, to tune into, but, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I think I just got a little fired up. <laughs> uh, if you prefer the clips, the clips will be going out. I, I finally figured out a way to, to do the clips without losing my mind. Um, and that's if I'm putting it out in the evening, I will put out uh, clips uh, one in, one later 
at night and then two the following day in the morning and afternoon. Um, just so I like my brain can keep organized and keep on top of things without losing my shit. Uh, so yeah, th uh, um, so so keep an eye out for those clips if the clips are what you prefer. Uh, okay, well, I think that's it for the video for today. Until tomorrow, uh, we'll see you on the road. Bye.